Hi there. Um, welcome to um, the uh, second revision session on the AS Business Studies. Um, I'm um, I'm Alec Thomas. Um, if you attended last week, you'll know uh, who I am. I'm a teacher at Llandeilo High School. Uh, I've taught for about 10, 11 years now, and I have quite a bit of experience in teaching uh, the Business Studies A level. So the plan is today is to finish off Unit One. Um, we got up to about the point where we were looking at uh, starting to look at monopolies and sort of market structures and things like that. OK, then we're going to move on to demand. OK, so fingers crossed what we'll do is we'll get to we'll get to the end of end of unit two, uh, unit one today so we can start off unit two next week and unit four, hopefully towards the end of the fourth session where we can look at some more uh, um, exam materials. OK. So I will begin my slideshow from this one. OK. Market structures that we need to have an understanding of. OK, a monopoly, oligopoly, monopolistic competition and perfect competition. OK, in some um, exam boards that you do study, you end up seeing a duopoly as, as well there. OK, so a duopoly, a duopoly is where there is only um, two uh, significant uh, businesses operating within that market. So an example would be um, the airline building market is a duopoly because it's only uh, Boeing and Airbus that dominate that particular particular market. OK, so we're going to look at um, some of these in turn now. OK, I'm going to talk about them, maybe why they exist, what kind of structure you tend to see from these. So the first one is a monopoly. You've probably all heard the word monopoly. OK, when you think about the board game and if you think about it, what you're trying to do it within the game of monopoly is to is to is to dominate the whole board, isn't it? OK, so sort of buy up all the houses and hotels on, on all of it. And that's basically what a monopoly is. Monopoly is a single producer within one market. OK, now sometimes monopolies have been allowed to exist by the government because they felt it was in the best interest. OK, so you, you think of a lot of industries back in um, in the sort of the 70s and the 80s. OK, um, that ended up getting privatised. So we look at um, British Telecom, British Steel. Um, so a lot of these sort of government run, British coal, government run, um, um, government run monopolies, essentially, the government allow, allow them to uh, exist. OK, but there are a few issues with monopolies. OK, essentially, they suffer from a lack of competition. Now, we know from some of the stuff we touched upon last lesson that competition is good for us. OK, us, us as consumers, because it means that businesses end up competing with each other on various things. So it could be innovation of products, OK, improved service. OK, so competition can be good for us as consumers. OK, um, and they also compete with each other on price. So essentially, the theory is the more competition that you have within um, a particular market, OK, the more innovation and the better quality of product or service you will get. OK, and ultimately they'll begin to compete, compete with each other on price. Now, has that necessarily happened? OK, since we privatised some of these monopolies. So if you think about British Rail now, um, British Rail was was um, was a, was a nationalised run by the government, OK? And what they decided to do was they decided to break it up and to insert some um, competition into that market, OK? Now, they couldn't, they didn't compete in terms of building um, new railway lines, but essentially what you've got is you've got different providers that compete for contracts on, vary, on various lines. Now, if you've been on a train uh, lately in Britain, you will know that the service has not particularly improved that much and the price hasn't really come down. Um, I, for instance, didn't got a replacement bus service last night because I was coming back from a wedding in Scotland and um, that was um, that was a terrible service. I was not happy for it about it and I'll be asking for a refund. However, the point still it still exists is that, you know, we're, we're not monopolies shouldn't really happen, but they um, do sometimes end up happening. Maybe um, um, a certain business in a certain market start to have um, more power within their market, OK, um, because maybe of a, a merger or a takeover or something along those lines, OK, or, or maybe they just become so dominant in their market, got such a high market share, OK, they start to become an, um, a monopoly, OK. Um, however, there are various um, um, various groups all across the world that do try and um, outlaw uh, or try and try and regulate competition. OK, um, 
in the UK, we used to have something called the Office of Fair Trading, OK, but now that has been changed to Competition and Markets Authority. And what they do, OK, is they um, investi do investigations into certain um, certain markets. OK, one recent one they did was into the UK energy markets. OK, and you can go onto their website and you can see some of the cases that they've that they've looked at. They're not the most rock and roll interesting thing in the world, but it will give you a little bit of an insight into what they do. They also investigate complaints where people have, have stated that they have not been um they don't sort of believe that it's competition or they've um and it, it needs to look into that particular market in the in the european union there is the european competition commission and in the us you have something called antitrust laws which tries to encourage competition okay now um this is one good documentary that I've seen on this, and it's called Download, the true story of um, the Internet. Um, so it's a little bit of a history of how the Internet started. But basically, this is a bit of a documentary of how Internet Explorer became the most dominant um, web browser. OK, now you probably guys probably don't use Internet Explorer at all. I know I certainly don't. And I think they've changed it now to Microsoft Edge or something now regardless. OK, but um, what was happening was was most um, computers were being loaded with Microsoft software and on there the default um, default uh, web browser was Internet Explorer. So you start to see instead of um, being, there being choice between which web browser you chose, Internet Explorer was the default one and that's what most people have and they, just, they started to dominate the web browser market. So you're talking about sort of, the, you know, almost 90% market share. Now, it would be, it's, it's, it's a good doc documentary to watch, quite interesting, okay, and you can kind of see what they did now. So, if you've bought a new laptop recently, for example, okay, you will be given a choice as you are logging in, do you want Google Chrome, do you want Firefox, do you want Microsoft Edge, um, just, do you want Firefox or something like that, okay? Um, so it gives you the choice now, and that's a direct result of uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a legal case brought forward by the Office of Fair Trading, European Com Competition Commission, and the antitrust laws in the US to break up this monopoly that um, that Microsoft and Internet Explorer had over the over browser markets. Okay, um, so worth having a look at. Um, anyway, okay, so oligopolies, okay, so there are um, many businesses, but only a few dominate the market, okay, so um, a good one there, like I mentioned in the last slide, is um, the UK energy market, okay, we essentially have the big six, um, and there's been a lot of studies into are they really showing, um, uh, you know, enough quality of service, is, is there, is there, enough competition going on okay because in olig oligopolies okay what you can find is that businesses tend to um act together okay and we call it collusion okay and what they say is is a, a cartel is is formed okay where they basically decide they're not going to compete with each other on price so they can kind of keep the the prices um artificially high and not com compete with each other so much Often when I say, use the word cartel in my teaching classes, um, someone will put their hand up and go, what, like the uh, Colombian and Mexican drug dealers and things like that. So that's where they've heard the word cartel before. Now, a cartel isn't necessarily just this cool word they use for a gang in Mexico and Colombia. OK, the what they actually did was there was there was an there was an olig oligopolistic market for the, the cocaine market in uh, in the U in the USA at this time. OK, so this is slightly off topic, but it always helps my students learn. OK, so they decided they were going to um, um, divide up the market. OK, so if you ever watched a TV show called Narcos on Netflix, you would have you would have seen this, that they decided that um, a certain cartel, a certain um, a certain group were going to dominate the Florida market um, and no one else was going to sell there. So they keep the prices high. Same happened in, in New York. They decided so one one was going to have the New York market and they kept those prices artificially, artificially high. OK, and that's why you call them a cartel, OK, because they, they work together to keep prices artificially high and did not compete with each other. OK, so if that helps you remember it, um, then then maybe do. I, I would say maybe watch watch Narcos a bit of a, um, market research, maybe um, for for this uh, for this course. Right. Perfect competition next. OK, now this is unrealistic. OK, and 
perfect competition is, is merely a model. It doesn't really ever exist. OK, so there's a large number of businesses. OK, all the goods are homogenous. OK, everyone has equal access. Um, they all uh, consumers have full market information. OK, so they basically know as much about the product as you do. OK, there's no barriers to entry or exit. OK, um, so there's no like, say, high start of cost to begin with or something along those lines. OK, so this perfect competition is is on the model of ones you have to look for, but it doesn't really exist. What we tend to see a lot of um, when we're dealing with any sort of business is either sort of the oligop oligopolistic markets. Or we tend to see monopolistic competition, OK, where there's a large number of uh, quite small businesses and they compete with each other. There are, aren't many barriers to entry. Products are similar, but they are differentiated from each other. OK, um, so that's how they compete with each other. There are different things, um, different features about the products. OK, um, so they don't have like they only have a limited degree of control of the prices they charge because they're sort of competing, uh, competing on price to a certain extent. OK, but they're generally competing on on product features. So if we have a look at the spectrum of competition, OK, we almost have we have perfect comp competition where there is, you know, you know, this perfect model of identical product, many firms competing with each other and so on. OK, all along to the um, sort of the, the worst as aspect of competition, which would be a monopoly. OK, so this is how you look at it. OK, monopoly, one um, one dominant business, oligopoly, a few dominant businesses, OK, well, identical or similar products. Uh, monopolistic competition, which we see a lot of similar but not identical products where they compete on product features. OK, then you have perfect competition with, where there is identical, identical products. OK, excellent. OK, so that's um, that's those. OK, um, now competition um, means that we get access to good quality products um, that, that have been that have been innovated. OK, and we end up um, having businesses compete with each other on on price okay however um oligopolies do exist monopolies do exist okay um so consumers need protecting um from being exploited by these businesses that may be overcharging okay their products are unsatisfactory okay and there is um one of the sections later on is we look at how how we protect consumers okay um so there are some laws that have been set up in order to protect consumers against not just unsavoury practices in terms of the market structure, be it a, a monopoly or an uh, oligopoly or a duopoly or whatever. OK, but there's also just sort of helps you um, helps consumers be protected from maybe um, uns unsatisfactory goods um, being sold, being missold something. Um, um, not being able to return unsavory credit agreements and so on okay um and they just try and make sure that businesses are healthily competing with each other okay now that is quite a difficult section of work as is the next section of work okay so we're moving on to looking at supply and demand um now this is probably some of the most difficult stuff that you're going to do um for this uh, for unit one okay um and really it's, it's a bit of an introduction to sort of some basic level uh, economics okay you probably this is probably i would say gcse standard um economics okay but it, it's it's kind of quite difficult for some people to sort of get their head around because with businesses it's kind of um something that some people can see right in front of their face where this might not be something that you can kind of completely relate to um so if we take the example of monopolies and oligopolies you can you've all heard of businesses that might be monopolies or oligopolies where supply and demand is something you might be able to sort of um, imagine in your in your brains it's probably worth pausing a little bit longer at making sure you learn and understand this supply and demand there's loads of videos out there on the on youtube that sort of help deepen your understanding of it okay so what we're looking at this unit essentially we're looking at supply demand equilibrium point how that impacts upon price and and quantity okay and i'll try and include some real life examples particularly with some of the stuff that's going on in the world right now that we can kind of understand it okay all right these are key terms okay um and we'll sort of get to most of those while we're going through our explanation 
OK, so this is a demand curve. OK, demand curve slope, slopes down from left to right. OK, uh, the way I always remember it is D stands for down, so it always slopes down. OK, because, you know, often when I get students to draw this, they'll draw it the wrong way around. They'll draw demand curve sloping upwards uh, or something like that. Just remember the demand curve essentially always, um, always slopes downwards. OK. Um, Essentially, as the price decreases, OK, um, the quantity demanded is going to increase. OK, right. So what you've got also is, as one of the key terms is effective demand. OK, now effective demand is is a step on from demand where if I was to ask you, if I was to survey everyone on, on this video now, if they would like to um, buy a, a Lamborghini car, well, you would say all say yes, OK, and so that you would probably hazard a guess that the demand for Lamborghini cars would be high based upon this factor. But essentially, if we, if the crux came down to it and we have you, you know, like put your money where your mouth is to buy this, OK, demand would actually be relatively low. And that's what effective demand is. OK, so it's not just that you demand the product, you actually are, you know, you have the ability to buy and back up what you want to what you want to purchase. OK, so just please remember that to have understanding of what the difference is between demand and effective demand is. OK, now um, supply is the amount of product which suppliers will offer to the market at a given price. OK, all right. And the supply curve slopes upwards. OK, um, again, it's a real stupid way of remembering it. OK, but supply. The second, second and third letters is up. OK, so supply always slopes upwards. OK, all right. Now, the way I try and explain this to my students is um, if you were uh, a fisherman, for example, right? Um, and you were getting a, offered a, you know, you have to, have to go out every day to sort of get your fish or whatever. OK, um, the if you're being offered a higher price for your fish, you would probably spend longer out doing it. OK, so generally the, the higher the price that you're being offered to do it, the more you're willing to supply it. OK, all right. Now, this is an equilibrium where we're basically we're now plotting our supply and demand against each other. OK, and what we have is an intersection. OK. Um, and it's essentially where buyers and sellers, you know, agree that this is the sort of the given price um, for the goods. OK, now. There are many factors that can affect demand. OK, um, so when incomes increase, you see demand will increase. OK, you can see um, change in taste of fashion. So if something goes out of fashion, you see demand drop. OK, very government laws might mean that demand um, increases or decreases. OK, complementary goods and substitute goods. OK, so things like um, if you're going to the cinema, OK, you've got to have a drink and some popcorn. Well, that is a that's a complimentary good, isn't it? OK, so let's say the price of popcorn and drinks substantially went up. We would probably see demand drop for people going to the cinema because they would see it as quite a, you know, a large expense of 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 going. OK, you've also got substitute goods. OK, so you would probably argue that maybe tea and coffee are interchangeable. OK, so if the um, price of um, of coffee goes up, then maybe you, you're going to see an increase in demand of tea because people can kind of switch from one good to the other. OK, advertising, a good strong advertising campaign can 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 increase demand. OK, maybe um, more people have moved into your country. You mean change a change in population or even maybe just a simple change in demographic of people who do buy your products. OK, so shifts in the demand curve. OK, um, so what we're seeing now is there's been an increase in demand. There's been a shift from D to D1. OK, all right. So demand demand has increased. And what you what you've seen here is if you see the original intersection. OK, so we've got the, where D and the lines of D and S are intersecting. OK, you what you've got here is you've got points P and Q. And that is basically um, this is the price. OK, at this level of quantity. OK, now what you've seen is an increase um, in demand here. OK, and what you've seen is that the, the price has gone up and the quantity has also increased. OK, so that's a, that's an uh, that, that that's how you would plot an increase in demand. OK, so maybe you might be asked to draw something like, um, you know, there's been a increase um, 
well, in sales, well, increasing demand due to um, your product coming into fashion, please plot this on a demand curve. This is this is what, what you would have to plot and explain. Okay. Now, a shift in demand. Okay, so let's say your product has now become unfashionable. Okay. Um, and what you'll see, if you see the original intersection between D and S, okay, all right, and then you compare it to the decrease in demand, which is what we're looking at is line D1 intersecting with S, okay? We see that the price has dropped from P to P1, okay? And the quantity has dropped from Q to Q1 there in this in this example. Okay, so the quantity demanded has gone down and the price has gone down, okay? Right, shift in the supply curve, okay? So um, S1 is a decrease, S2 would be an increase from S to S2 is the increase, S to S1 is the decrease, okay? Now, what can impact supply, okay? So it could be change in costs for the supplier, okay? Weather can have an adverse impact on it. So let's say that a farmer um, is producing goods and there is some poor weather and um, they're unable to produce um, produce the produce their crops. Okay, maybe there'll be an introduction of new technology, and it's easier for you to maybe make your um, make your product. Okay, um, legislation that from government that can impact um, what you what you're supplying as well, and how easy it is for you to maybe get get to market. Okay, it could be I don't know some new regulations or some new uh, maybe a trade embargo or something along those lines. Okay, and you're seeing recently um, things like war also has an impact upon 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 supply. Okay, so you're definitely seeing that with um, petrol prices right now. You 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 maybe heard your parents complain that price of petrol has gone up. To about one pound ninety, I believe. Okay, and that has that that's directly related to the supply they're able to access. Okay, so Russia has a lot of um, sort of petrol and gas reserves. Okay, and that's having a negative impact. And hopefully, I'll explain it to you on the next slide now why that happens. Okay, so. If we concentrate on the original intersection here, okay, so if we look at S and D, the lines where S and D intersect, okay, um, this would be, would have, this would have been, let's say, the price of petrol three weeks ago, okay, prior to the sort of the invasion of Ukraine, okay. Now, the supply has decreased, okay, because of various factors relating to war and, and trade embargoes and stuff like that. And what we've now seen is a shift from S to S1, okay. Now, what we have seen, okay, is the important points now is if we go, if we follow where it's intersected S1 and D, okay, we go down to Q1. OK, and basically one of the reasons, OK, that because so the price has gone down, uh, the price has gone up is because there is essentially less quantity available because um, of the sort of the, the the sanctions placed upon Russia. And what that meant here is, is there's less petrol available and the price has has gone up significantly. OK, so if you if you're struggling to sort of understand what what we mean by sort of supply decreasing and what that impacts upon quantity and price, please just remember some of the petrol examples. OK, right then. Um, so that is supply and demand. Now that's a real difficult, some real difficult concepts there. OK, and some people are going to struggle with it. OK, but I would recommend watching as many videos as possible. OK, it is relatively well, I was going to say it's relatively straightforward to understand. It's quite a difficult concept to understand, okay? But there is an endpoint if you're willing to sort of graft at it and, and, and look at it in a bit more a bit more detail, okay? Now, the other thing that we need to look at here again is, which is a relatively difficult concept, is we're looking at price elasticity of demand. Now, you don't need to know the formula and you do not need to... Um, um, understand what some of these figures mean, okay? But... What we've, if what we need to know about price elasticity is essentially is how sensitive um, it is to a change in price. Okay, or how supply, how how, um, how sensitive demand is to a change in price. Okay, now essentially, the, if I was going to sort of give an example of this, is let's say you were walking down your sort of high street in your town, and there were four market stalls. Sorry, three market stalls. Okay, and these three market stores, all they sold was white t-shirts. Okay, and they, they sold these white t-shirts for five pounds a pop. 
Okay, so all three stores sold some of five pound. And what you've got there is you've got sort of almost perfect level competition here, aren't you? Sort of some of the stuff we talked about before. Now, if one of those stalls was to increase their price of their goods, okay, to six pounds and the other two had it in five pounds, because the goods are homogenous and the same, that kind of thing is real, um, is real sensitive to a change in price. OK, so um, you, you're going to see a huge. So if, if you look at the one on the left hand side, the sort of the this elastic demand curve, the price has gone up a little bit. So the price has gone up from five pounds to six pounds. OK, but the quantity, OK, has dropped off significantly. OK, all right. So if you see here, um, it's, you know, it's gone from. Um, so if we look at P2 and Q2, OK, on the on the one on the left hand side. OK, what we've seen is the price go up a little bit. OK, and the quantity de demanded decrease hugely. OK, on the flip side of that, we've got inelastic. So some goods aren't particularly sensitive to a change in price. OK, so if we uh, let's say consider some demerit goods that we buy. So we're talking um, cigarettes, petrol, um, alcohol, um, you know, some of these things are that, that are not particularly good for us. OK, um, sugary sweets, um, um, sugary drinks and stuff like that. OK, these have got an inelastic demand curve. OK, so essentially these aren't they aren't very sensitive. So you can always put up these put up the put up the price of these goods quite significantly. OK, um, so if you look at um, sort of compare, if we look at on in, in the middle one, we've got P2 and Q2. OK, well, what we've seen is a massive increase in price there, but quantity hasn't dropped off nearly as much. OK, and which is why I refer to that as inelastic. OK, it's not very sensitive. OK, unit elasticity is just sort of like, a you know, they as as much as you put the price up, the quantity drops off in the, in the same comparison. OK, so it's almost like, you know, you, you in terms of the spectrum of it, it would be, um, say, very elastic, OK, normal elastic, which is unitary elastic and then inelastic would be a lot more vertical. OK, all right. You don't need to sort of learn how to um, draw these. You just have to have an understanding of what price elasticity means. OK. You've also got income elasticity of demand. OK, so how responsive uh, demand is to change in income. OK, so if your incomes increase or incomes decrease, OK, you start to see um, an increase or decrease in demand of certain products. OK, so it could be that, um, let's say, for example, you have a massive increase in income. What you start to see is demand. Well, if, if the general population has a huge increase in income, you'll start to see that people are going out to restaurants and going out for drinks a lot more. OK, what you're going to see now is Incomes have necessarily de decreased, but because of, say, rate, um, rising um, petrol prices, um, rising costs for national insurance, uh, rising um, electric and gas prices, OK, the, their incomes will stay the same, but probably this, this, the, 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 their disposable income has decreased. And so you're going to start to see a real hit on, you know, things like like restaurants and, and 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 bars and stuff like that, OK, because people don't have those money to sort of go out and spend as much as they used to. OK, um, we refer to that as a kind of a, a normal goods. OK, it acts in quite a normal way. It has kind of quite a positive relationship, doesn't it? OK, so as incomes increase, demand increases. As incomes decrease, demand decreases. That is a, that is a normal, normal good, but not all goods um act in the same way okay you've got luxury goods okay now luxury goods are these high end okay we're talking you know um you know we're talking kardashian level you know like we're talking like gucci we're talking um louis vuitton you know um fabergé egg whatever do you know what i mean all these all these real fancy brands you know these real expensive cars that people buy okay well a change in income and in, in a general level of income rise for everybody okay probably because it isn't going to impact luxury luxury the sale of luxury goods okay because to be honest if you're rich enough during the good times to buy the goods you're still going to be rich enough during the buy the bad times okay so luxury goods don't really sort of see an increase in demand or a decrease in demand that kind of goes along with 
levels of income. OK, you've also got inferior goods, which has a negative as an inverse relationship. So basically, as increase as incomes increase, demand decreases. OK, as incomes decrease, demand increases. OK, so I'll give you an example, which I always give to my the, the students in my class. OK, so when you're doing well and, and you and your incomes are, are high, OK, what you often do is like you'll when you're working is you'll go pop out to lunch. OK, oh, I'll, I'll just go to co-op or I'll go to um, just go somewhere, go to Pret-a-Manger, whatever. OK, and you'll just, you know, you'll spend five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pounds on lunch every day. OK, but as soon as you start to feel the pinch, OK, what do you start doing? You start bringing in sandwiches to work all the time. OK, so what you see as incomes increase, sales of things like Tupperware, OK, tends to increase as people are going, oh, better start watching. I can't be spending uh, going out for lunch every day. I'm going to bring in bring in uh, bring in sandwiches from home. And that's what you start to see. Um, Tupperware is an, it's an inferior good. OK, it's more demanded when people are doing badly. OK, when the economy is is, is doing poor and demand is demand is low generally because of the because of the um, um a decreased level of income okay so you have an understanding of those with price elasticity income elasticity normal luxury and inferior goods you need to you, you just need a grasp of those key terms okay right next one market research okay this is quite a straightforward unit should be able to sort of bash through this one quite quickly hopefully okay so what we're looking at is what in market research, what is primary and secondary research, what is qualitative quantitative data, OK, what is sampling, OK, all right, OK, so quite a straightforward unit, I'll probably try and bash one, this one out quite quickly. Key terms here again, OK, so what is marketing? Essentially it is finding out what people want, OK, where they go, what features they want in their products, what they're willing to pay for it, OK, where they're most likely to buy it, OK, and where is best to communicate that information with them. Essentially, what we're talking about is a four P's of marketing, OK, price, place, product, promotion, OK, all right. Um, and with all this, the four P's, you can pull together a marketing strategy, OK. Um, so what they do, OK, is they'll undertake research, find the needs of the customers, OK, um, you know, what where the demand is increasing, OK, and they'll do a mixture of sort of primary and secondary research here, OK. Now, the basic, the basics of this unit, OK, it's not, you know, marketing is something you've probably done in GCSE, and to be honest, if you, um, if you, you know you, you're advertised to constantly so you probably have an awareness of what's going on okay you need to know what the difference between primary and secondary research is primary is your is your field research where your surveys your questionnaires your focus groups your observations okay um you know you, what's good about primary research is that um you can get it sort of tailored to exactly what you want you can find the information out what that that you that you um that you that you want to find out then you've got your secondary research okay which is your desk research stuff you can do on the internet so if i got got asked you all to get your phones out now right can you find out about the toy market in bangladesh you'll be able to go bang 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 right okay yeah here's some information about a toy market in bangladesh it would be at the touch of your fingertips okay so secondary research is quick and it's cheaper where primary secondary is slower and more expensive okay all right um different ways of going about doing a different types of research of primary so like i said surveys focus groups um observations interviews okay secondary research we're talking looking at um magazine articles looking at demographics and research and competition okay all right difference between qualitative and quantitative okay quantitative Quantify is something that you can uh, you can count. So we're talking sort of closed questions. So what color what do you want this uniform? Red, green, blue, tick, right? And you can make some graphs and you can analyze it. OK, whereas qualitative research, it gives you that quality level of response. OK, so essentially what you're getting there, OK, is you're able to kind of say um, you can you can get insights and feelings and how people feel about it. So if I, instead of asking what colour do you want, uniform, red, green, blue, okay, you can go like, how do you feel about having blue as your um, as your uniform? And they can explain it to you and you can get a bit more insight, but it's more difficult to, um, um, more difficult to analyse, okay? 
what is sampling? OK, so it's basically how you go about choosing who's going to do your research. OK, and it's really important to try and avoid uh, avoid bias. OK, so you've got, you've got to understand the difference between quota and random sampling. Random sampling is anybody has a chance of being asked um, this um, this survey, this questionnaire, whatever. A quota is basically um, they go, we need this amount of people from this certain demographic. OK, so we need two people from, you know, uh, two people who are female and between the age of 25 and 30. OK, and then we need three people between this age group and this gender or whatever. OK, so it's basically sort of looking at maybe who your key demographics are and finding and researching how they, how they feel about your product. So that was a real sort of whistle stop tour on marketing research, uh, market research. I think it's quite a straightforward unit uh, and you would have done it probably at GCSE. OK, consumer protection, we touched upon this in uh, in the unit. We were looking at monopolies and oligopolies and so on. OK, um, so what we've already covered, consumer protection and why consumers need protecting. OK, we've touched upon that already. So the legal stuff. Um, now, you don't really have to be able to sort of in verbatim explain what each one of these are. OK, all right. But you've got to understand that these are there for you. So I'd, I'd, I'd make sure you have an understanding of essentially what the high, what the headlines of which what each one of them are. So we're talking about Consumer Rights Act 2015. Um, OK, are the basically are the good satisfactory consumer credit laws that people are given information, a cooling off period of 14 days and the um, the APR, the interest rate is given to you very clearly. OK. Um, consumer protection from unfair training regulations. OK, it's basically just to protect you from uh, untrue or misleading um, information about your products. The consumer contracts, information cancellation, additional charge regulations. OK, and this helps you when you are basically buying things from a distance. OK, so we're talking when you're buying things over the phone or over the Internet. OK, the role of the ombudsman, what, what the ombudsman does, and that's essentially a deal with complaints. OK, trading standards departments. OK, um, so, you know, what is um, you know what are, are, is there unfair trading practices okay have they taken advantage have they you know have they got such more so much more information than you and they've taken advantage of you okay competition and marks authority have touched upon what they do okay and you've also got um groups like the citizens advice bureau okay and you need to understand what they do which is to sort of give you um essentially give you as advice as consumers on maybe you know what laws have been broken who you can complain to and so on okay so again you're not going to be able to have to ex probably explain those in any particular question but again it's having an understanding of what they are okay ethical issues related to consumer protection okay um so we probably all understand what ethics are okay it's the right and wrong of a situation okay and what businesses also always sort of seem to have a bit of a clash with is the fact that is what they're doing illegal or is it ethically right? OK, so for example, let's say that Nike opens up a factory in Sri Lanka. OK, now it might be legal in Sri Lanka for um, they might they might have real relaxed child labor laws. OK, well, even though it's legal, is it real ethically right to be employing children to make your trainers or your clothes? OK, and that's this is why a lot of businesses have something called um, the CSR policies. OK, so corporate social responsibility policies. Now, these might be just a bit of marketing material. OK, all right. Um, that sort of outline how your business is going to be um, as going to be ethically. OK, um, so. Yeah, so just essentially you need to understand that. There's certain practices that business undertake that are probably not ethically right. OK, and what business try and do about them is set, set up policies and, and so on, because if they're not acting ethically, what you often find is that you might find um, um, boycotts, um, you know, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of negative maybe news news articles that are put out there about them. OK, and that's this impacts impacts demand. So I think um, yeah, it's, it's quite a straightforward forward topic, this one. OK, all right. So we'll move on to the sixth section then. OK, we're looking at business structures. What we're looking at this one is difference between private and public sector. OK, um, 
we're looking at sole traders, partnerships, um, charities, co-ops and, and such things like that. OK, so what are the key terms here? OK, um, one thing that we need to make sure that people understand of understand the difference between is limited and unlimited liability. Now, unlimited liability is basically the person and the business are um, seen as one entity okay so essentially you have unlimited liability if you're a sole trader and a partnership because if the business runs up debt you are personally liable for those debts limited liability in the eyes of the law you and your business are separate entities so if the business runs up debt okay you as a person as that business owner is not liable for that debt okay and limited liability companies are your private limited companies and your public limited companies now um, what some people get confused about here, because there's a lot of use of the word private and public, OK, difference between private sector businesses and public sector businesses. OK, so essentially public uh, private sector is basically caters for your for your wants as consumers, really. OK, um, and these are sort of your your businesses that you might see on the high street that sort of that that set that sell to you okay where public sector are things that are provided for you by the government through um taxation okay all right so we've sort of talked about this what the public sector is um often what they do is they provide for you um some public goods okay these are regarded as non-excludable and non-rivalrous okay so they can't exclude and there's is no rivalry okay and what they often do is they provide merit goods for you okay so the example i always give to my students on this one is let's say someone walked knocked on your door and said right uh, and the street light is on outside can you please pay me five pounds for that being on every month you would go no i don't want to pay that i will have the um the street light off but obviously Having street lights on it good. it's good. It's a good thing. It makes cars safe, people safe, and so on. Okay, all right. So they provide for you merit goods that you may you maybe wouldn't consume. Okay, if it were, if you were left to your own devices. Okay, so you're all a lot on this revision session. Okay, schooling is seen as a as a merit good. Okay, you are probably would consume that. You probably pay for it if you had to. Okay, but you can probably think of plenty of people you went to school with. I know I certainly can. That if they were left to their own devices, they would not consume um, that that good. Okay, so you can see, you know, you can see probably by the say, you know, we have to pay privately for our dental care for example you can probably see the fact that people's dental care isn't as strong as maybe their health care because the health care they don't have to pay for but the dental care they do okay so they don't consume it even though it would definitely be regarded as something that is good for you okay right different business structures okay now these are just require revision a sole trader one person business partnerships two to 20 people prior limited companies and poly limited companies are basically companies that have limited liability like i mentioned before okay poly limited anyone can invest in them private limited you have to be invited to invest in them okay charities and not-for-profits or social enterprises have a relatively similar thing where they basically have a social community conscience and they are running to sort of try and um better society or better local area or benefit a certain group okay cooperatives are kind of part of this like um sort of sort of labor social movement okay where um you know it started off with groups of farmers around kind of manchester sort of banded together to make a, to work together okay um because they felt they were getting taken advantage of okay so they felt that you know these you know these individual businesses could work together and could um, provide fairer prices for those kind of business and that now that kind of ties in with the ethics of what they do now OK, um, it's sort of one member, one vote. There's no like dumb, there's no like in a PLC where anyone can invest um, and can become a sort of dominant partner or a dominant shareholder in co-op. It stops that and they often um, do a lot of fair trade and things like that. OK. Right. So um, we haven't really got to the point where I was hoping to today, but there isn't a hell of a lot for us to finish by next session okay but we'll move on to stakeholders and we've got a couple of other things so we'll move those through that quickly um i'll just check if there's any questions before i finish off the meeting okay right nothing up there okay well thanks for coming guys um 
Um, I'll um, see you next Monday for revision session number three. Thanks for coming.